Good afternoon. It's Friday, December 18. I'm Giovanni Dennis with the Midday News. A special welcome if you're watching online at onespotmedia.com. Despite the deployment of police and soldiers, gunmen continue their deadly rampage in the community of Farm in Effortville, Clarendon. A couple was killed while walking in the community about 8 o'clock last night. They have been identified as welder Leroy Taylor and his wife, Sonia. Both were 54 years old. Head of Operations for the Clarendon Police, Superintendent Christopher Phillips, says police believe the incident is a reprisal for Wednesday's shooting in Farm, where six persons were shot, three fatally. Both husband and wife were seen lying face down along the roadway. It what appeared to be gunshot wounds to their heads. This appears to be a reprisal based on our initial assessment of it. And it is so disappointing because we had a strong deployment of police persons. Along with military that were in that community, we will continue to monitor it. We have threatened the deployment in the area as we anticipate that we might have even further counter reprisals. No grand market. That's the word from Chairman of the Westmoreland Municipal Corporation. It follows the announcement of tighter restrictions for the parish earlier this week by Prime Minister Andrew Holness. Now, the Prime Minister explained that the tighter restrictions are due to an increase in the number of COVID-19 positive cases in the parish over the last four weeks. Details in this report. It's six days before Christmas and the time which many look forward to for a little extra cash. However, that prospect has been severely hampered due to the presence of COVID-19, which has been affecting Jamaica since March. Many people thought that by now, things would have gone back to normal, but not so. It has led to the government taking stringent measures to curb a significant rise in cases of the respiratory illness. But with a ban on parties, another warning. This time for vendors who normally travel to sell their wares in the western parish of Westmoreland. I just want to make it low and clear to those vendors who are coming from other parishes to come into Sablamar that do a better come this Christmas. See if you're straight for next year. Health Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton, who led a march through the town of Savannah Lamar yesterday, has issued a call for the local adherence to the protocols. However, he says the decision ultimately falls at the feet of the citizens. We may have to take stronger measures if that is not working, because right now we can't allow it to continue in this way. But the business community in Westmoreland says with the tighter restrictions, they are now bracing for a greater fall in revenues. Currently, the curfew for Westmoreland begins at 7 p.m. nightly compared to the rest of the island with a 10 p.m. curfew. O'Shane Masters, TVJ News. 283 people have now died from COVID-19 in Jamaica. Four deaths were confirmed on Thursday. The deceased are a 71-year-old woman from Clarendon and a 41-year-old woman from Manchester. The other deaths are a 94-year-old woman from St. James and a 73-year-old man from Kingston and St. Andrew. Meanwhile, two other deaths are under investigation. Now, cases of the respiratory illness have also risen to 12,039. There were 71 new cases on Thursday. Their ages range from 14 days to 98 years old. Effective today, mobile service providers Digicel and Flow are expected to provide clearer pricing and framing information in their advertisements about their products and services. This is part of the second phase of mandates from the Office of Utilities Regulation, OUR. For these companies to provide more detailed information on standalone services or service packages to their customers. Now the first phase was implemented in October. Vashon Brown reports. The OUR has stipulated that the following four decisions be implemented by both telecoms providers as of today. The telecoms must provide clearer pricing and framing information in advertisements. There must be clearly stated current prices and all available charges, as well as full contract details that must include all pertinent information, such as caps, inclusive minutes, texts, data, exclusions, limitations, and the duration of any fixed commitment period and any limitation to the use of such service. Clear information for roaming customers must be provided. 
Customers should have access to all information written in plain English on the products and services on offer. The information must be available on all platforms used by the service provider. The telecoms providers must promote services especially available for persons with disabilities and how they can access such services. The OUR's decision to issue this determination notice follows complaints from mobile telecommunications customers about issues such as unexpectedly high call charges for postpaid subscribers, non-receipt of notification when data credit is nearly exhausted or has been exhausted, incidents of rapid credit depletion when credit is applied for data use in the case of prepaid customers, and exhaustion of data plan credit when mobile data is disabled on their devices. Vashon Brown, TVJ News. Several members of the legal community are advocating for reform of the process which leads to the appointment of the Chief Justice and the President of the Court of Appeal. While speaking on Radio Jamaica's Beyond the Headlines Thursday, former President of the Jamaican Bar Association Ian Wilkinson says the current process should be abolished. Al Oshin Masters reports. Both the Chief Justice and the President of the Court of Appeal in Jamaica are appointed by the Governor-General on the advice of the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister is required to consult the Leader of the Opposition before offering his or her advice. However, several members of the legal fraternity believe it's time Jamaica moves away from that practice. In a Gleaner article published on December 17, Senior lecturer in the Faculty of Law at the University of the West Indies, Mona, Tracy Robinson, said Jamaica needs to engage in a meaningful constitutional reform. She argues that as it is now, the functions of the executive and judiciary arms of the state, which in principle should be separated, are blended. Former president of the Jamaican Bar Association, Ian Wilkinson, agrees. Speaking on Radio Jamaica's Beyond the Headlines on Thursday, Mr. Wilkinson said neither the Prime Minister nor opposition leader should play such an important role in the appointments. Firstly, the involvement of, of, of politicians immediately will, will cause a problem for me, bearing in mind the hallowed principle of separation of powers. It, it, it might be inevitable or unavoidable that important figures in our constitutional framework, such as the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition, being of necessity politicians, must be or might be involved in the process. But it doesn't have to be. I do not think that the Prime Minister or the Leader of the Opposition should have the, such an important role in, in appointing such important judicial officers. Recently, Justice Dennis Brown retired as President of the Court of Appeal and Judge Justice Patrick Brooks was appointed. Mr. Wilkinson is suggesting that the positions be publicly advertised and an independent body be created and tasked with reviewing the applications. All these positions should be advertised. There's nothing in critique about it being advertised. It's transparency. So if you know a President or a Chief Justice is going to retire, that should be communicated early if there's no exceptional situation where a judge's tenure is being extended under the constitution you advertise it early so that people know people should know a month before or two weeks before it should be known well in advance you should have an independent body and this is where i agree with tracy except i don't think it should go back to the prime minister i think you should have an independent body who will review these applications based on well-published criteria. Oshade Masters, TVJ News. Peter Bunting was today sworn in as the eighth opposition member of the Senate. Mr. Bunting wasted no time in delving into the controversy, which delayed his swearing in by two weeks. Last week, Norman Horn admitted that he still held U.S. citizenship, which makes him ineligible to serve as senator. Mr. Bunting, who is also leader of opposition business in the upper house, said the debacle served as a reminder of the need for constitutional reform. Mr. President, given that certain constitutional office holders and indeed investigative journalists had to grab the bull by the proverbial horn to enable the Senate to be fully constituted this morning, we are again reminded of the need to review our constitution to ensure that it evolves in the service of our people.
Mr. Bunting says the need for constitutional review was made even more evident with the Supreme Court's ruling in September that the detention of five men under the states of emergency was unlawful and unconstitutional. As it currently stands today, the government has not appealed this decision. Thus, the findings of the court are unchallenged. I raise this case to highlight a collective failure on our part as legislators to recognize the defects in the law, but also a failure in repeatedly voting to extend the states of emergency when the situation did not qualify as such. The oath of allegiance obliges us to uphold and defend the Constitution, not the expedient goals of an executive. And it's now time for us to take a break here on the Midday News, but please stay with us. We'll have much more when we return. Welcome back and we're continuing the news. Things are starting to look promising in the tourism sector, this following the recent opening of a tourist attraction and the ongoing construction of several other attractions which will provide jobs, boosting the country's economy. Details in this report. The jobs in tourism are coming back. Enthused Tourism Minister Edmund Bartlett commenting at the opening of the Chaka Ocean outpost in Sandy Bay, Hanover on Thursday. Due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, at least 130,000 jobs in the sector have been lost. Mr. Bartlett said the inception of the attraction has brought hope. Because with the opening of this facility, workers are now back on the job. Hope is alive again in the industry and in the economy because tourism, which is the industry that has the fastest recovery rate and is the preferred industry for the recovery from global disruptions, is working and is working for Jamaica. He's projecting that 40% of tourism workers will be back on the job by April 2021 when the winter tourist season ends. As of November, we have brought back 30% of the jobs that we had lost and we lost 130,000 jobs um, just in the wake of the pandemic. And in this winter, we hope to claw back another 10% or so. So by the end of April, we could be looking at 40% of the workers and industry back, and this is good. The tourism minister added that several other tourism projects worth more than one billion U.S. dollars are still on track despite the pandemic. The princess development for um, uh, Green, Island. Green Island is still on top, 2,000 rooms. The Hard Rock uh, um, Casino and Hotel 1,700 rooms is still on track. A 500-room facility for Richmond in St. Anne is still on track. The um, Sandals development uh, for um, Duns River, you can see the outline start still on track. And there are several other developments of that nature. The latest investment is the St. Regis Hotel to be built in Bull Bay, St. Andrew. And it's a Jamaican investor from Wall Street and he's coming to see us and we are going to look at the property he has bought it already 250 acres overall and it is going to border st thomas and st andrew and it will become the first of the development in the new destination of st thomas that we have just created shamela pullen tvj news and Tourism Minister Edmund Bartlett says he expects the sector will earn at least 40% of the revenues which were garnered in the winter tourist season last year. There has been significant downturn in, the in tourism since the COVID-19 pandemic broke out globally, with the island's major source of source markets, the United States and Europe, battling severe outbreaks of we, the coronavirus. We, we, we make that point uh, with the certain knowledge that tourism is definitely on the comeback um, and we also are driven by uh, the imperative of of the recovery being driven by tourism because if tourism doesn't come back the recovery of the economy is not likely to happen um, at least in the short run um, the standard and poor has made a very clear point of it in their um, rating of jamaica 
uh, and their analysis of our growth um, projection, saying that we will recover next year, but that recovery is going to be driven by tourism, and it is absolutely true. So we have to do everything to make sure that that recovery in the meantime, Mr. Bartlett says the entertainment sector must adapt to the changes that are now taking place globally. There have been calls from some promoters for the government to allow some level of entertainment, but there has been no easing up thus far. Now with some hotels hosting parties, concern has arisen. We're always comparing ourselves to what is happening in my sector versus another sector and so on. But one of the problems with that is that we lose the essence of what we must do to make our sectors rise to the level where they must go. Because the, the pandemic is offering a challenge to everybody. Every sector is being challenged by the pandemic. But the way each sector responds to the challenge is going to determine whether it survives or not. Discussions about the capacity of Jamaica's health sector to deal with serious burn victims continue. One parliamentarian is now pledging to start the change. Herman Green reports. The call for a burn unit in Jamaica intensified after Kerry Ann Collins died because the treatment she needed was not available locally. Health Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton has since explained that while he's not against the idea of setting up a burn unit, the cost is exorbitant. That did not sit well with Kerry Ann's relatives. Member of Parliament for St. Andrew's Southwest, Dr. Angela Brown-Burke, sent us video footage of her visit to the family. The family expressed disappointment in the minister's statement, with Dr. Brown Burke promising to push for change. When you're going to outright said it's too expensive and Jamaica wastes a lot of money. The resolution that I'll be calling for is for the establishment of a burn unit or for a facility that could treat burn you burns of this nature and other wounds that are similar. I believe that we have to do that. Earlier this week, Dr. Tufton said after consultations with medical professionals, it was deemed to be cheaper to help badly burned patients to get help overseas than to set up an expensive unit for a few possible patients each year. However, speaking on Radio Jamaica's Beyond the Headlines with host Dion Jackson Miller this week, clinical coordinator at the Cornwall Regional Hospital, Dr. Delroy Frey, and vice president for the Medical Association of Jamaica, Dr. Andrew Josephs, had slightly different views. Dr. Frey insists that Prior to the closure of the Cornwall Regional Hospital for refurbishing, the hospital was equipped to handle burns. We had a specific ICU unit to manage bed. In fact, our seven-bed ICU that we had before we shut down was equipped to deal with major burn cases. However, Dr. Josephs sees things differently. For the majority of the hospitals, we the same thing, where if ICU space is available, it's shared between Burns patients and regular patients, which is just not ideal at all. So um, in terms of existing burn units, no, we don't have any existing burn units in Jamaica at this point. Should we? Um, we should. Ideally, we should. I'm not sure of all that is required. I know. I've heard the minister say that it is expensive. But I really believe that based on uh, the kind of uh, demand for something like that in Jamaica, and just seeing and feeling the anguish of the family that we have to do something. Tragedy struck in Montego Bay last evening, leaving where well, two persons dead following a motorbike accident. Now dead is 22-year-old Akeen Gaynor from Betheltown in Westmoreland and Monica Blackwood of Stone Edge in St. James. TVJ News understands that four persons were attempting to cross the Bogue Main Road shortly after 8 o'clock. They were hit by the motorcycle, killing two persons on the spot. The two others were rushed to hospital where they were admitted. Traffic was disrupted. Right now it's 10.30 and I'm still here. This is very long though. And you just want to get home? I want to get home. I'm tired and I have to go back to work early again in the morning. Residents of Islington in East Portland are desperate to see an end to the long-standing water shortage plaguing the community. But as Sasha Lee Hamilton reports, the desire to have running water may not be realized anytime soon. This is the project residents of Islington in East Portland were depending on to bring an end to the water problem they've been facing for the past 20 years. But as it stands, the wait will be longer than expected. 
That's because Geotech Exploration Services, the company contracted to drill the well, has refused to continue. We have waited a long time and the machine that we are using up here is needed. And we apologize for the technical glitches in that story. Moving on to sports now, TVJ Sports understands that there could be a third contender for the presidency of the Jamaica Table Tennis Association. Jerome Foster has the details. Dr. Ramon Midas, a Jamaican attorney at law living in Florida, is said to be interested in the post of presidency when the next annual general meeting is called. In a release sent to TVJ Sports on Wednesday, Dr. Midas took a swipe at the current administration over its handling of last year's AGM, which was later declared null and void by the Supreme Court. Dr. Midas is quoted as saying, The practice of facilitating the inflated ego of an uninformed president that has no regard for a sport he has never played and clear contempt for the laws of the highest court in Jamaica while turning a blind eye to the misdeeds of the incumbent administration has made our Table Tennis Association a laughing stock of the region. It is this attorney's professional opinion that they all should be legally barred from every aspect of the game for a period to be determined by the same court they have violated. End quote. The release went on to say, quote, If elected president, I will continue to honor the tradition and sacrifice of those table tennis players who have preceded me and will seek to pass on my knowledge and experience to those who follow my path. I will faithfully serve my community of table tennis players while recognizing that the truth is a strong medicine and must be delivered at the right dosage, end quote. A date for a new AGM is expected to be set once the current arm pass at the JTTA is resolved. Jerome Foster, TVJ Sports. Incumbent Godfrey Lothian and Andrew Liu are likely candidates to contest the election. And that's the Midday News. I'm Giovanni Dennis on behalf of the news, sports and production teams. Good afternoon.